are all set. Great. All right, good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak break of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Excuse me, one second. <laughs> Excuse my little visitor. <laughs> Uh, as I was saying, please be aware that other people may see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So I uh, will now confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are present through a roll, roll call. Uh, please identify if you can hear me. Kin Lau? Present. present. David Watson? Present. Uh, Eugene Benson? Present. present. Katie Levine Einstein. Present. Great, and Rachel Zemberry as chair, I am present as well. And I believe we have uh, Jennifer Raitt from the Department of Planning and Community Development. Present. present. And uh, Aaron Zwerko joining us as well this evening. Present. present. Do we have anyone else from the department on tonight's call? Okay, great. All right. Let me switch my screen and we will move over, open the first item on tonight's uh, agenda, which is docket number 3638, 400 to 402 Mass Ave. Um, this is a, the new opening of this, of this public hearing. Um, and I'll first ask Jenny if you have anything from the department um, summary that you would like to begin with. I don't actually have anything further than what's in my department summary. Are you receiving feedback? I'm not sure what's causing it. Very bad feedback. Of everyone except Rachel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Okay, sorry everybody. I don't know what to do about that. Wait, if you... Okay, that's better. Okay, so right, I will, for everybody. Great. So, are you receiving feedback when I'm speaking? No, it was it when was, I was speaking, and you were you were unmuted. Is it is better now? Okay, so I'll I'll just make sure that I mute whenever anyone else is speaking. I'll just make sure to keep myself unmute, except for. Not sure what's going on. Um, so I will um, ask the, uh, let's see, I think Attorney Anessi, are you uh, here to represent this? Oh, you're on mute, Mr. Anessi. Mr. Anessi, you're on, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, I'm accompanied this evening by the architect Ken File, and Frank Pescudo and Cynthia Pescudo will be in the background uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the presentation as well. This is an application for environmental design review relating to property at 400 to 402 Mass Ave. Uh, and this, the, the relief, zoning relief in connection with this property goes way back to 1980. And in 1980, the uh, Pescudo family, uh, Frank, appeared before the Arlington Zoning Board and basically requested zone relief. And they granted him relief to have two residential units in the building. 
the, and by the way, the building is in the Avon Historic District. Uh, we are not, and I'll repeat this again, we are not, and if there's any indication in any way that the board feels we are, I want to hear about it. We are not making any exterior changes to the building, notwithstanding what might be shown on the plans, which you may have, and Ken File will get into that in a bit. Uh, with respect to uh, the jurisdiction, we had to go before the Arlington Zoning Board because they acted on this matter back in 1980. We had a hearing before the uh, Zoning Board, and I believe that you have a copy of the zoning decision uh, where uh, the Zoning Board indicated uh, that uh, they were going to defer jurisdiction to the ARB uh, because in fact uh, the uh, ARB uh, basically with mixed use uh, now has jurisdiction under environmental design review of the property. So what we are proposing, and, and that's why we're here by the way, because the zoning board has basically acquiesced in our coming before the ARB. So we are proposing four residential units for the building, uh, and three of which would be one bedrooms, one would be a two bedroom, and we're proposing an office use as well. If you're familiar with the property, the property uh, is, by the way, is in a B1 zone, and uh, in, in my mind, it's on the fringe of the area that separates the, uh, the high intensity retail area of Arlington Center from the less intensive area as you go down Mass Ave, where you have a more mixed use uh, uh, basis for, for the buildings, okay? Uh, which is not necessarily the case in Arlington Center. Uh, it's the property, in fact, is across from the fire station. Uh, and as you have, you've seen from the dimensional form, uh, we have 4,000 some odd square feet as far as the lot is concerned. Uh, we are non-conforming in many respects. Uh, and uh, the zone relief that we're requiring uh, basically is under environmental design review. And in addition, uh, I have asked for relief with respect to uh, uh, the a property abutting a public way with respect to setbacks as well. Uh, what I did do uh, in my, uh, my memo, uh, the environmental impact statement to the ARB is, I invoked the Transportation Management Act. Uh, I have been corrected by the planning department with respect to uh, the fact that uh, I really do not need uh, uh, any relief with respect to a parking reduction. Uh, we need six parking spaces, uh, start that, five parking spaces, and we have six parking spaces. So we do not really need uh, any relief from the uh, board with respect to a parking reduction. Nevertheless, uh, and as uh, the planning department memo has indicated, well, Mr. Anessi proposed that in his uh, memo, in his environmental impact statement. So why don't we see if we can hold him to it? Well, uh, I am going to basically uh, get into a discussion of the Transportation Management Act. Uh, uh, we are in fact uh, going to provide an EV electrical outlet, as you can see, hopefully from the plans. It's going to be in the back of the lot. Uh, that's where the EV connection is going to be. And Ken Fowle can talk to that uh, when he uh, gets involved in making his uh, presentation. Uh, uh, we are also going to provide, and we're going to suggest for bicycle parking, we're going to suggest short-term and long-term. The uh, long-term bicycle parking would be inside of the building, and it would not be on the same level uh, as the street level. Uh, it would be down a, a flight of stairs because we don't have room elsewhere in, in the building for the in-bike storage. But we would have room in a storage uh, area in the lower level of the building for uh, in-bike storage. We would also provide for short-term bike storage 
uh, at the exterior of the building, uh, and that could consist of a bicycle rack uh, uh, at the exterior of the building. And uh, I'm sure we can have a discussion about that uh, with respect to what your thoughts might be. Uh, the, uh, we don't intend to go before the Historic Commission uh, because again, we're not making exterior changes to the building uh, of any kind. Uh, the, uh, with respect to landscape space, uh, we've indicated in our presentation what we have for landscape space, I think it's 687 square feet. We don't intend uh, to change that. I'm sorry, 864 square feet. Uh, and zoning would require 555 square feet. Uh, we have no open space of any kind. Uh, so uh, uh, that is not something that I will be getting into a discussion about. But again, with respect to the jurisdiction and the ability on the part of the ARB to give us relief, I believe that the ARP has uh, plenty of, of authority to give, a, uh, give us relief w with respect to that issue and other issues. Uh, the usable open space, as I say, is zero, will remain at zero. Traffic uh, circulation, Ken can talk to that. It's gotta remain unchanged with one way traffic in and out uh, to the parking spaces which are located, as you can see from the site plan, to the rear of the building. And uh, as the planning department memo has indicated, tandem parking is in fact allowed under the bylaw and we are going to in fact have tandem parking. Now, one of the comments made in the planning department memo was that the parking uh, in that area behind the building and exiting the building could be kind of tight. Uh, and query, would it make sense for the petitioner to consider uh, compact parking? We certainly are open to that recommendation. If, if that's something that the board in its wisdom would like us to consider, we are willing to consider it and adopt any suggestion that the board may have with respect to compact parking. Uh, the, uh, the surface water drainage is gonna remain unchanged. As I believe you may be aware, and if you're not, I'll suggest it to you, uh, the parking area out back is paved. So there's a not an awful, and there's not landscape uh, space back there, there's not an awful lot we can do with respect to how the water runs off. It's been running off that way for many, many years since the building was first constructed, many, many years ago. We don't suggest any changes to that. Uh, we do suggest that, uh, the, that we're not doing anything within the interior of the building that would change that. When rain happens, it hits the roof, comes down off the roof, goes into the parking lot, that's the way it's been happening for many, many years, and that's not going to change. There will be no changes to the utility service to the property. Uh, with respect to advertising features, that was also mentioned in the planning department memo, and we would prefer to deal with that administratively. We don't think that we're going to have any plans as far as signage is concerned that will necessitate uh, are coming back before the ARB uh, with respect to looking for relief. Uh, there is a sign out front in the building right now. There may be a sign on the side as well, but we're not, again, we're gonna do that administratively with the, uh, with the planning department. There'll be no new machinery installed at the building, so we're not talking about putting equipment on the roof. Uh, we're talk, not talking about shading anything as far as the roof is concerned, uh, uh, shielding anything as far as the roof is concerned, or anything of that nature. All opened and closed spaces at the building will remain unchanged. Uh, and uh, we have uh, submitted a lease report of the grassy, the architect, that's Ken File, by the way, uh, with respect to lease considerations uh, uh, with, with regard to our proposal, and I'm gonna let Ken talk to that issue, and I can come back in. Oh, by the way, one more uh, matter that uh, uh, in my uh, generosity, 
uh, I proposed in the Transportation Management Act when I was under the impression that we did need parking reduction was a shower uh, in the office unit. If we don't have to do that, we would prefer not to do that. If we did have to do that, of course we would, but we would prefer not to have to do that if we could. What are we offering in return? We're offering the EV charger in the back of the building. We're offering the bicycle, uh, 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 indoor parking uh, that we don't necessarily have to offer. So we're hoping that that will be enough for the board to consider in terms of whatever relief they feel they need to give us as far as the plans are concerned. Ken, why don't you jump in and talk to us about what's going to happen in the interior of the building? Sure. Um, Jennifer, would it be possible for me to either share my screen or our ability to mark things up? Um, which would you like me to bring up? I've already got oh. uh, things ready. So what oh, would you Jenny, like Jenny to Jenny has to bring it up, Ken, as I told you earlier oh. today. Yes, my apologies. Um, Jennifer, if you could bring up um, uh, the document that I emailed you on uh, earlier this evening. Um, that would, I think, help explain, uh, give a greater visual picture, both the picture and the plan. Perfect. And then could you also bring up the plan as well? Okay. My apologies. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Mr. Mark. Awesome. Okay. Um, um, again, my name is uh, Ken File, a uh, partner at LaGrassi Anowitz and File, LYF Architects. And um, in response from our initial uh, submission to this board um, and going through the planning board, the, the planning department's memo, um, we have located um, addressing different, different items that were brought up in the memo. Um, as you can see, We'll start in the upper right-hand corner. Um, the potential location of a, a trash enclosure that would allow trash receptacles and recycling receptacles to be stored um, underneath the stairs. Oop. Thank you. Um, and we'll see, I'll show you some pictures there in a second. Um, the electric charging station located right next to the, to the tandem parking. The temporary uh, bike rack off the walkway to the lower level, um, right off the, um, the driveway for temporary use of um, short-term use of storing bikes. Um, and then again, as Bob um, Anessi, had, Attorney Bob Anessi had mentioned, if we are needed to require a toilet in the existing office space, um, there is a potential location um, in, that, in that office to put a shower in. Um, if we could scroll down a little bit more, thank you. And then in the existing building storage space, we can, which is again, one level down from um, the main entry, we would be able to partition off a, a permanent bike storage location for tenants to store bicycles, uh, both the office as well as the residential units to be stored inside the premises and not outside. Um, and as uh, Bob had mentioned, we had written a lead narrative. Um, since all the renovations are happening internal, um, offices being converted to residential units, um, all the lead considerations that we can consider are really more interior, they're all interior focused. Um, we can focus on using uh, low emitting of materials such as paints and coatings, adhesives, sealants and flooring using post, um, uh, high post-consumer recycled products. Um, and then for any HVAC units that we put in the, 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 into the units for the, the unit living, the uh, new residential uh, units, um, we can actually make sure that we have better indoor air quality as well. Um, we are within a uh, access to quality transit and um, we will also be looking to, um, again, use 70, at least 70% um, recyclable um, components that are, uh, that are in the, um, that were being used in the renovations. And then any toilet fixtures using low water production, uh, dishwashers, showerheads, toilets, 
and um, again, using energy efficient heating and cooling equipment for the renovations. Um, again, these are all internal changes. And here on the, the pictures, we can start seeing on the exterior where we're proposing the electric charging vehicle at the back of the building, the location of the trash enclosure underneath the steps, and then the bike rack, the temporary bike rack uh, for storing bikes temporarily uh, just off the walkway, off the driveway. So I, that encompasses, um, addresses the items that were uh, brought up in the planning department's uh, memo. Um, happy to answer any questions, or I'll turn it back to, to Bob and to Attorney Bob Anessi. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> as an addition to what I was saying earlier, uh, in quoting from the uh, uh, planning department memo to the members of the ARB, uh, we are looking for four residential units, uh, which is an addition of two, an additional two from what was there before. And the department memo talks about the fact that the master plan recommends uh, supporting commercial areas by encouraging new redevelopment uh, and uh, uh, new residential as well as a commercial space. Uh, and again, we're going to keep this mixed use. We're going to have an office. We can't have a retail use there. We're not going to have a retail use, but we're going to have an office use there and we're going to have a uh, residential use uh, uh, as well. Uh, and you will note, by the way, on the prior plan that had been submitted, uh, we had showed an exterior, an exterior uh, shed-like area for uh, covered bike parking. That's not going to be the case because that would be a change to the exterior of the building. And we, again, are not making any changes to the exterior of the building. So uh, if you have any questions at all for either Ken or myself, we're more than happy to respond. Thank you, Ken and Bob. So we'll run through um, a roll call of the uh, redevelopment board for any questions or requests for clarifications from the applicant uh, prior to turning it over to public comment, and then we'll discuss at the end. So we'll start with Ken Lau. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I generally have no issues with um, switching some uh, office space to uh, more desirable housing uh, in, in this area here. It's just that I, I do question the type of housing you're creating. Um, Ken, um, yes. if we look at the, your proposed floor plan, let's start, yes, with, let's start with the basement. Yes. <clears throat> I know you don't wanna, uh, I know you, you're saying you're not changing anything outside, okay? That's correct. We have the living room and we have the bedroom. I just oh, think. One, scroll down, please. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Where well, you have the living room and we have the uh, bedroom. Yes. Uh, that living room is going to be a dark, dingy space. There's no windows. You got that one window underneath the stairs. It's underneath the stairs. Okay. Yes. Is there any way of switching that with the bedroom and just making it a much more livable space? To me, it's just. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. want to do housing for the sake of housing. I, I want to sure. do good housing up. And is there a way of looking at it so you can maybe switch that around a little bit? And I think there, there might actually be potential, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's, you know, yes, I do believe there's an opportunity to flip those two. The, the bathroom is a common bathroom anyway. So it really is just about how do you present, how do you bring the bedroom over and still have access out that back door. Um, but I definitely believe we can make that happen. Uh, that would be great. Um, that's one comment. And then if we, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what's happening on the, uh, the two upper units. You have these spiral staircases like right in the smack in the middle of the, uh, of the living room. Yep. Um, Th those are interesting. Okay, but what 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 kind of space is happening behind or around that that um, um, staircase? It doesn't. Uh, if you look at the living room space, uh, go down. Scroll down. Yep. Here you go. Yep. 
it's See? really just circulation around. It's it really is just circulation around the stair because as the stair comes up to the upper uh, loft area, um, it comes up on the exterior wall. So that is it's it's the where the existing um, stair is right now. We are not proposing any changes to the unit four, unit number five. I realize that, and I'm just looking at it saying, you, you, you could make those, I think those could be two very nice, nice units, especially the unit number four, sorry, unit number five, where there's a deck out there, you know, having a, um, a, uh, a bedroom upstairs, and then having uh, one on the back there, that could be, that could be your prime unit, um, your, your penthouse unit, and, and uh, I think, you should, I'm just su suggesting maybe you look at maybe modifying that stairs. I don't think a stair would be that costly. I'm just stating that it would make that unit that much nicer. I don't want to have just units, you know, just for the sake of units. Um, you can tuck that, tuck that over your owner and say, uh, I'm going to have to, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then you look at them and say, look, you know, is the payback, uh, for up upgrading these stairs and making that uh, upstairs space and downstairs space more valuable, will they be able to get that back in the rent? Sure, I, I, and she and, and the owners are on the on this call as well, so they they're they're being aware, made aware, ready. So this is thank you for so much. That's a thank you for that comment. I'll mark okay. that up. Yeah, I'm just trying to make these nicer units. I just don't want to do units, you know, and just squeeze them in any, any which way. Um, and as far as if we go back to a site plan, uh, can we do one where it shows the site plan a little bit? Yep, that's yep. Go up a little bit. Maybe the next floor. Yeah, that one right there. Okay. The roof. Uh, the roof leaders come down on gutters outside the building, right? Yes. Are they currently tied into the uh, storm system, or are these or are they just dump out to the yard? As I understand, well, there there is no storm, there is no site drainage to this building that's underground. Uh, no, so I realize that. It's also it is all it is all surface drainage. So the roof le so the roof leaders that come off the roof comes right and drain into the side side the side yard. That yes, they drain around the building. That is correct. That's that's how the building is currently existing. Yes. Okay, so there so there is some recharge in the open space and some of the the side yard because it does drain there and whatever absorbs into the ground will absorb into the ground. Right. Some of it. Yes. Yeah, some, some aspect of it. Uh, and the only thing I can ask is um, if there is a roof leader that drains into the parking lot, can we see if we can drain that onto the open space first and then see what, uh, what, what open space there is. We'll take whatever, um, um, uh, initial water, and then if there's overflow, then it goes back into the driveway and goes out like it was before. It's just a small, small gesture to just try to recharge the water back into the ground. I and, totally, under, totally understand the, the the desire and the concern. Um, uh, it would definitely need to be because it it is all paved back there right now, um, and if we try to bring it into the side yard, we're cutting across walkways. Um, I, I, I would need to do some further study to see if there's opportunities to create maybe some small gravel location that might be able to recharge something near the building, um, potentially. Or a swell, you know, where it might just go there first. I'll kind of bring it around. Yes. Just asking, okay? This, yeah. this oh, is definitely yeah. not a demand. You know, uh, you certainly don't have to do it. And I'm just saying that uh, you know, it's a nice gesture. Sure. Under oh, totally understand. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm marking my plan. I, I'm, I'm I apologize if I'm quiet for a second. Yeah. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Ken. Uh, David? Thanks, Rachel. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I feel about this one. Um, this this is different than other projects we've been reviewing under mixed use. Um, other projects uh, we have either added 
uh, commercial space uh, in addition to residential where there was no existing commercial or uh, in states where there was existing commercial, we have either um, um, accepted projects that reallocated that commercial space or, or in some cases reduced the amount of commercial space um, in exchange for a significant number of new residential units. And here, we're, we're basically making one-to-one -one trade offs where uh, eliminating commercial spaces and replacing them with with residential spaces and um, I, I'm it, it doesn't feel like it's this it, it's um, generating the same level of benefit that we like to try to achieve with the mixed use bylaw. One question I have is, um, are, the, are all three uh, office spaces um, uh, currently in use and have, have they historically been occupied? Uh, the, uh, I don't know whether they're all three are currently in use. One is certainly current, currently in use. And that's uh, in use by an attorney, okay? Unit number uh, three. But I'm not so sure that the other uh, two are, quite frankly. Yeah. I realize that these aren't suitable for, for retail spaces. We would not be evicting people if that's what your, your point was, okay? Uh, no, I'm just concerned uh, uh, with trying to balance um, the need for commercial space in town and the need for residential. And uh, as I was saying, where we've done mixed use in the past, we have been able to significantly add to the residential stock um, uh, while either adding commercial space or, uh, or um, reconfiguring existing commercial space. Um, and, um, you know, here, uh, while these aren't these spaces aren't suitable for retail, uh, they certainly uh, are are suitable, and in fact, looks like designed for office use uh, up to this point. So I'm. I think I'm one little, of the one of yeah. the, uh, if I could, uh, Mr. Wilkins, one of the considerations for my client has been that they have been uh, been under, under the impression that the town was uh, looking for in need of additional residential space. And that has been one of the motivating factors along with the idea that they could uh, in fact, uh, of course, lease or rent the, uh, the spaces, okay? By the way, the family uh, is not in the business of developing property and going condo with it, okay? That's not what they do. What they do is they develop property and they keep it. So their intent would be to uh, maintain this family uh, with respect to, uh, again, the residential and commercial mixed use. I think historically, if you went back with respect to the building, uh, you'd find that the building was in fact used uh, for residential purposes, if you go way back, okay, and not uh, office uses. Uh, there are office uh, spaces available in town now. I know that, okay, uh, for people who are looking for office spaces. Uh, and again, uh, my understanding is that additional residential spaces would be something that the master plan uh, contemplated uh, and that has been a motivating factor for my clients. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the master plan does contemplate uh, adding uh, residential, but it also um, contemplates expanding uh, commercial opportunities in town. And, you know, here, instead of growing, kind of growing the pie and getting both, we're, we're trading off one for the other. And um, I'm not as excited about that. Um, I'll, 
let me think about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. With respect to the tandem parking, um, you know, having uh, seen that in in action um, in 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 other places and knowing um, uh, that it can be somewhat awkward when you're dealing with um, residents uh, or occupants of multiple units sharing tandem spaces. Um, a little bit concerned about how that's going to work in this context where you've got uh, you would have uh, five completely unrelated parties uh, uh, sharing essentially two tandem parking spaces we're going to we're going to assign parking for the tenants uh, so that they are going to know which space or spaces they will have access to well, what happens if the person in, in space number one needs to leave and space four is still there? In, in terms of moving the vehicle? Yeah. Well, th th that's something that happens all the time. Uh, David, if you go down into East Arlington right now and you go down any street in East Arlington and you look at the tandem parking in East Arlington, that's exactly what happens, okay? Uh, there's tandem parking in driveways. And what has to happen is uh, one of the owners has to go to the other one and say, we'd like to move, okay? We'd like to get out. Uh, could you please move your car? Could you please allow us to do that? That happens yeah, I, all I, the time. I, yeah, I, I understand that, but I, I think that's certainly not a desirable situation. Well, the problem and is it's also yeah. it's also not a situation that I think we typically see uh in uh things that are larger than uh than a two or a three family. Yeah. But we're dealing with a a peculiar site. It's not a large site, David. Okay. It's a small site. And we, we're dealing with uh, the hand that we've been dealt uh, as far as the parking is concerned. And we're trying to do, uh, do the best we can. And again, the zoning bylaw does allow for tandem parking. If it did not, then a lot of people in East Arlington would not be able to have parking. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, um, all right. Uh, let me ask another question. With respect to the indoor bike parking that's proposed, um, how would that be accessed exactly? Um, yep, if, you, if Jennifer could scroll down real quick. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And so this is the main, this is the, it's accessed off of the main front entry stair. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, a that is basically common that can be accessed by the office as well as the residential units from the outside and um, and going up that main stair and they, the bike storage will be right off that main stair going you come in the main stair you can go down to the bike storage through its own uh, doorway that's that's that can be locked and then you go back up to your unit so I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm not sure I'm understanding the, the flow. So oh. you come in the front door of the building. Yep, which is then, uh, the next plan up. Yep. And so then come, where do you, and then so you, you go down on down. the left? That's correct. You come, you go down the stairs. You go up, down, there you go. Yep, down the stairs. And then you end up right at the door of the building, the building storage. So you have to go down down the stairs to what an intermediate landing and kind of and That's make correct. a right and then go down again yes it is a it's a u it's an existing u-shaped stair um that goes down to that lower level that is the uh that's the only um storage space that's available going up the building no i i, I do appreciate that um that I'd say um, having requiring people to to carry bikes up and down stairs is definitely not not preferred. Um, and 
Uh, here it's even more awkward because they have to make a turn with their bicycle while they're while they're maneuvering up or down the stairs. Um, so it's it's definitely not optimal. Uh, I mean, agreed. I definitely not ideal. Yeah, I recognize there there isn't um, necessarily another interior space where that would work. Um, and I know, uh, I, I would say, I, I know you you really don't want to get into um, the, the complications of adding anything outside. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in a situation like this, providing some kind of um, covered secure bike parking outside might be preferable. And if you only, if you're actually only required to provide uh, uh, five parking spaces, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if it's feasible to uh, repurpose one of those parking spaces as uh, an enclosed bike parking space uh, so that people uh, could roll in and roll out and not have to deal with the carrying bikes up and down the stairs. Are you talking about an exterior change to the building, David? No, I'm, I'm talking about, well, I'm, I'm not sure of the implications of this because this would be uh, doing something, doing in, something the right. yeah. in, in the parking area, in the parking area that's now paved and uh, repurposing one of those spaces and necessarily building something on it. Um, I, I think that might trigger uh, going back before the historical commission. Yeah, um, it might. Um, I'm, I'm not think sure. It probably will, as a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I think from a usability perspective, um, doing something like that might be might be preferable. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of options that don't involve uh, carrying bikes up and down the stairs because that's uh, that is not um, a preferred way of providing uh, indoor bike access. Excuse me. Hi, this is Cynthia Pesciuto. Um, yeah. Mr. Watson, I think I can answer some of your questions. Um, the tenants that are on the units four and five have bicycles. They've been okay. keeping them actually in their apartments. So they are accustomed to taking them up and down the stairs. For them, um, as we spoke to them about this, it would be a bonus to have them in the basement in a secure location that would, um, there'll be a, a lock where you have to punch in a code that only they would have. Um, so that that would be a big help to them. Um, as for I can I can definitely see how that could be an improvement over over yeah them having them in their two, apartments two flights yeah exactly it, they said it would yeah. be much easier for them um, and was something they would appreciate. Um, uh, as for the tandem parking, um, the tenants um, within our leases we actually assign parking and within the lease. Um, we actually tell them they have to work it out together. Um, they've been doing that since the 80s, um, because as you can guess with the um, person that's in the commercial space, in the office space, um, they're maneuvering more than the residents. So they've always worked that out amongst themselves um, without complaints. Um, we, we've never really had to get involved with that. Um, they all share their numbers um, and the, the people upstairs have always been long-term tenants. Um, Attorney John Hurd is a long-term tenant. Um, we have had the basement unit available for more than two years. Um, the, the town, uh, as you might know, does not allow body workers for a very good reason. And that seems to be what is attracted to that building. And so we are trying to, of course, avoid that and um, comply with the town. Um, as for the um, first floor unit, um, that has been uh, vacant for a year, um, and that was the decision of the, the tenant to leave. Okay, that's, that's useful information. 
Any additional right. questions, David? Um, the only other thing I, I uh, think I would say is um, I, I wouldn't, I don't feel strongly about holding you to uh, installing a shower in the, um, in the remaining office unit uh, since it isn't required uh, in this case for, for parking reduction. And uh, also since it sounds like there's an existing tenant there who is content with the way it is. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think I'm feeling like this isn't the most exciting project and I'm not, not sure it, it really, um, advances the town's goals in any meaningful way. Um, but, um, uh, I, I don't find it particularly objectionable. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Jean Benson. Thank you and good evening everyone. Um, thank you for the interesting presentation about the proposal. I have questions and comments about parking about the amount of office space, about the lead checklist. And um, before that, I wanna sort of weigh in on Mr. Lau's suggestion of perhaps flipping the um, living room and the bedroom in the basement unit. Um, I would hate to see a basement unit where the bedroom has no windows. I much prefer to see windows in the bedroom, and I'm not sure what those things are called, transoms or something where the light transmits, mm -hmm. you know, high up in the wall yes. from the bedroom into the living room. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think to me that would be preferable to ending up with a bedroom with no windows, personally. Um, so let me get to my other issues. Parking. Um, so, I mean, people have talked about the tandem parking and the issues with um, the tandem parking. I wonder how you respond to this part of the town zoning bylaw, which says parking and loading spaces other than those required for single family and two family dwellings shall be arranged to avoid backing of vehicles into any street. I can't figure out how these cars are gonna get out of the parking lot without backing into the street. So can you respond to that? Yeah. Um, you know, it, that, that la the last parking spots, five and six, um, you know, they, that's, they, they, they move out into the street. Um, you know, they can, you know, they're all assigned and, um, you know, if there's opportunities for them to move forward to allow other cars to park, um, obviously they would do that. Um, Cynthia, how do they presently do it and how have they been doing it for years? Cynthia? I had to unmute myself. Um, they have been uh, pulling in and then they, uh, they back out um, is how they've been doing it for years. Um, we can tell them to park facing forward so that they're not backing, backing. out. But they've been doing that um, for years. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I appreciate how difficult the parking is there on trying to fit in the numbers um, that you'd like to have or that are required. On the other hand, I'm sort of sensitive that if we're gonna give us a special permit, we have to be sensitive to what the bylaws currently say about parking, which is the avoid backing of vehicles into any street. Um, I don't know if it's possible to do this. You really only need five parking spaces, not six um, under the bylaws. So I'm wondering, and I don't know the answer, but I'd like you to come back 
next time and think if there's a way to do this, where if there's a way by reducing the number of spaces to five to either make it easier for people to get in or out or less likely they have to back out into the street or something of that nature because you only need five for the residential. You don't need six. There's no requirement for um, parking for the, for the um, commercial business space. So I, you know, if you could at least look into that, I think it would be helpful, although I'm, I'll tell you, I'm having a little trouble figuring out why we should give a special permit to allow backing out into the street when the bylaw pretty specifically says arrange parking to avoid backing of vehicles into the street. And you can understand why they'd prefer not to have that happen. The, the second one is about the bicycle parking. And uh, David brought this up, but I'd like just to sort of amplify what he says. The bylaws say bicycle parking must not require lifting bicycles off the floor or carrying bicycles up or down any steps or stairs. So I think that's a bit of a problem. And I understand how the tenants would much rather have the bicycles in a basement storage area than in their apartments, but they'd probably even better prefer a storage area where they don't have to carry the bicycles up and down a set of stairs that have a, a turn around it. So I think one of um, your challenges, and, and David suggested one option, I don't know if that's a good option, maybe there are others, is to see how you can uh, have bicycle storage when they don't have to carry bicycles up or down stairs. Um, so I don't know the solution, but I will point out that the bylaw says, you know, you can't require bicycles to be carried up and down the stairs. Um, the amount of office space, I'm, I guess I'm having a little bit more concern, but the same concern that David has expressed about it, in that I agree that the town Master plan calls for the need for more housing, but it also calls the need for more commercial space. And what this proposal would do is reduce the amount of business space, as you call it, from about almost. Almost 2,700 square feet to only about 630 square feet. And to me, that's a rather huge reduction. And to have only just over 10% of the square footage of the building devoted to um, business space and the rest devoted to commercial raises the same issue that I had with um, 1500 Mass Ave which is this doesn't feel to me enough like a mixed use building. It feels to me more like um, an apartment building with a little office so it can qualify technically as mixed use, but I'm not sure it meets the um, goals or the spirit of um, the bylaw for the reasons David stated and for the reasons I've stated. And I just sort of wonder if there's a way where, where, and I'm not suggesting you do this, I'm just wondering if there's a way where the entire first floor could be office space. So you'd end up with three apartments, the one in the basement and then the two that you currently have that would do at least two things for you. One is it would, I think, have a better percentage of um, business space in the building. And second, it would give you some place to put the bicycle storage area. And third, you'd need even less parking to meet the requirements. So we'd have a better situation with the parking in back. So. I am concerned. I'm going to listen to what my colleagues have to say about 
this too, but I am concerned about the paucity of business and whether it's just on the wrong side of the spirit of the mixed use. Um, James, was there a question for them in that? that you no, I just like them that? to, I just like them to reconsider um, because they'll still end up with one more apartment um, than they have now and uh, less office space than they have now. But it's just something I would like them to consider and come back and explain whether they can or cannot do that and why. Or if they want to discuss that now, they can, but I put that out for their consideration. It's a small building. It's not a large building, okay? Certainly uh, not uh, the building that uh, would be going up at 1500 Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, I think historically, if you go back, uh, the building has been used more for residential purposes rather than uh, 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 commercial or office purposes. Uh, and again, uh, we did this because, and we're proposing this uh, because we looked at the same bylaw that you looked at and we interpreted it differently. Now, you're uh, in the position of authority and I'm not, but when I look at the bylaw, I can interpret the mixed use bylaw as saying for a lot that contains 4,000 some odd square feet, uh, why not have for residential units on that small lot and one office shooter. Because it, again, uh, if you are talking about a larger lot where you have the ability, you have the ability to create multiple office units uh, on the site, uh, that would be different. Now you did something similar to this you folks did back uh, on the uh, property at, uh, uh, the, with the nail sign on it that I had some months ago, okay? Uh, we did, that was an R7 or an R8, okay? And we did something very similar there. Uh, we did uh, the office unit on the first level and uh, the bulk of the building is in fact residential. And again, that was done because we were, th we thought we were furthering the intent of the master plan uh, in terms of creating more residential housing. And I think the same thinking applies to this site, but even more so because it's a very tiny site. It's 4,000 some odd square feet. If we were talking about a lot that contained even what's on 1500 Mass Ave, which is 7,500 7, square feet, uh, then I think I would probably agree with Eugene. Uh, again, you're the final arbiter, not me, okay? But I throw that out to you for your consideration. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'll listen to what my colleagues have to say because I don't think the master plan is driven solely by housing. And I don't think... I don't think it is either. That, yeah. And I don't think that the, the sort of zoning bylaw contemplates um, basically buildings in mixed use with just a very small amount of something that makes it mixed use. But I'm, 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 you know, I'm interested to what my colleagues on the board have to say on that. Um, on, on the lead, you, you, I think when you come back, I'd like to actually see a lead checklist. It was helpful to see the narrative, but I'd like you to actually convert that into a lead checklist, um, which is required. And um, that's it. Thank you, Jean. Katie? Thank you. Um, so I, my colleagues, I think, raised a lot of great points. Um, and so I'm not going to um, repeat what they had to say. But I, I think, you know, in response to Jean and David's concerns about um, the commercial space, I think one, one thing that is really tricky, this site is extremely constrained. And I think, you know, you guys did a great job of laying that out. And it's not clear to me that there is a lot more that can be done with the commercial space in this um, in this particular place. And I think when you guys come back, um, 
and presented would be really helpful. I mean, we already heard a little bit about how only one of the three spaces is currently in use. I think having a little bit more evidence about what other kinds of commercial spaces could even be here and whether there's really a market demand for this. Um, but the reality right now is we know that there's a crushing demand for housing, which is something that is very much in the, um, the uh, master plan. And it's not clear that there's a demand for these kinds of office spaces. And so I think if there's another kind of commercial space that could be in this particular small building, we would certainly be interested in that, but it's not clear that that's an option here. So I, I guess I'm maybe not as troubled by that issue as my colleagues are. Um, so my only, I guess, something that I would like to hear more about and to reiterate something that Ken mentioned um, is to hear a little bit more about the stormwater drainage issues. It was something that came up in the um, planning department memo, and I think that's something, if there's a way that you guys can address those issues, I think that that's something I'd be interested in hearing about. Um, but I, you know, it, it's a constrained site. I, I'm not as concerned about the office space issues um, as my colleagues. Um, so thank you. Rachel, can I uh, follow up? Uh, sure, why don't I um, ask the one question I have and then if it's a question, um, that would be great. If not, I think we're gonna save the rest of our discussion until after public comment. Um, but if you have something specific, another follow-up question to Katie's um, comment, please go ahead. No. Okay, great. Um, so the only question that I have uh, is related to signage. Could you just clarify again how you address plan to address signage for the one office space that you've proposed? Uh, I believe there was one sign there now. Cynthia, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't really intend to change that. So just uh, either remaining as is or exactly. remaining signed? Okay. And if we did uh, decide that we wanted to do something with signage, uh, we would want to do it administratively and not come in with any large uh, signs, okay? Proposals for signs. Great, thank you for the clarification, I appreciate it. Yeah. Great, um, so we will move now to public comment and then return for uh, discussion um, by, the, by the board. Uh, so if I could ask uh, for public comment that you please use the uh, raise hand func function, which is, uh, access through the participants button at the bottom of your screen. There's a raised hands uh, feature that you can that you can access through the participants section. I will uh, remind everybody that you you should please um, identify yourself by name and address when you speak when I call on you and you will have three minutes to address any questions or comments to the applicants. To my timer. So the first uh, public comment tonight will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a correction to point out about this application. Sorry, Don, could you please identify your? Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Thank I should have it right by now. Um, I have a correction to point out about this application. It claims that the two existing apartments are each one bedroom. Uh, that is not accurate. The so-called officer den shown on the third floor counts as a bedroom. You can check the assessor's card. It states that these apartments that already exist are actually two bedrooms each. That should be kept in mind when calculating parking spaces. What the proposal is asking for is three two-bedroom apartments and one one-bedroom apartment. Um, there are a number of problems with the parking lot, some of which the board members have talked about. Uh, I want to address, um, I'll address two of them. The bylaw requires that in a B1 district, uh, which abuts residential properties, which this does, there must be a screening buffer along the side and rear lot lines. It must be landscaped and it has to either be 10 feet wide or five feet with a screening fence. The parking lot requires this on both the side and rear. Uh, another problem is parking spaces five and six. They're not legal. They are in the Avon Place front yard and our zoning bylaw clearly prohibits such front yard parking. 
several people have mentioned this is a really small lot. It's hard to make do with and everything. And our bylaws uh, address that. It actually prohibits a four unit apartment building in anything less than a 10,000 square foot lot. Um, putting a small office in there and calling it multi-use doesn't make it more feasible. This four unit apartment on a 4,700 square foot lot in a B1 zone is neither reasonable nor legal. And this proposal does nothing towards meeting Arlington's goal for affordable housing. I'm a little sorry that the chair has not brought up uh, the subject which I presented in a letter to her um, about um, now that we have the Pesudos and Mr. Inessi here about another project um, which is um, under the board's oversight. Um, I hope that we'll go back to this um, before they leave the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Uh, the next speaker will be Wynell Evans. Thank you. Wynell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, my comment is not so much about the product as it is about the process. And I understand that the owner of 400 Mass Ave is also the owner of 882-892 Mass Ave, uh, where a project is underway. I was out walking the other night and got into a conversation, this was probably about two weeks ago, with the direct abutters to this project. They have small children, and with no advance notice to them, uh, about 9.30 one night, demolition began. And um, when I walk by this, this project several blocks from my house, I see that there is a large quantity of uh, demolished building materials in the parking lot. It's not in a dumpster, it's not covered. Uh, a lot of it looks to be from the interior of the building. Um, I don't believe that good neighbor agreements have been distributed and I have not yet been able to find any uh, permits online. I do know that inspectional services is a little bit behind in posting um, building permits. But nonetheless, there are um, uncovered, unsecured materials Ms. all Evans, over that parking lot. Ms. Evans, uh, I do want to remind you we're speaking about this particular application. Well, if you could bring it back to that soon, to, I would appreciate to bring it, it. To bring it back to that in the condition of the special permit that the ARB granted for that project, which I'm assuming would be similar to a special permit granted for 400 Mass Ave, uh, was continuing oversight by the board um, for the public welfare. And it seems not unlikely that if the practice is being handled at one project by the same property owner, that we're likely to see uh, some of the same practices at the project under discussion tonight. And I want to suggest that this is not, um, uh, not right. It's, it's not in line with our bylaws and it's not right for abutters either. This is, this is a really, really messy site. And I'd like to urge the board uh, to exercise its authority and, and see that um, this new project uh, is perhaps handled a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Chris Loretti. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments various people have made about parking. Um, one more I would like to add, and, and this gets to the issue of parking for one and two family homes um, being more relaxed than it is for more intensive uses. Once you get up to six parking spaces, the bylaw requires under section 6.11 that each space be directly accessible by an aisle or driveway. That means you don't have to confer with your neighbors when you wanna get out. You should have direct access to the street. And I would point out the very similar property at 418 to 420 Mass Ave that has the parking arranged that way with the appropriate buffers. That's needed in this case as well. Um, but I want to get uh, focus my comments really on the way that mixed use was sold to town meeting. And two of the things that were said at the time the bylaw was changed was one that it was to preserve business uses. And as um, was pointed out, this project reduces the business use by two thirds. That's completely contrary to the intent of the mixed use bylaw. 
and should not be allowed. The other thing, as uh, was pointed out, is that in the B1 zoning district, four unit apartment buildings are not allowed. And I thought it was interesting that Mr. Nessie said that retail was not allowed. Well, it's not allowed because it's not allowed in the table of use regulations. And similarly, apartment buildings, which means four units or more, are not allowed in the B1 zoning district. So you have to be consistent with both of those applications. It's not allowed in either case. And I think as the board is well aware, when they allowed a prohibited use in, the, in, in, a, in a district, because it was part of mixed use, contrary to what was promised to town meeting, it resulted in a lawsuit. And that lawsuit is ongoing right now. The owners of this property have to understand that they're opening up themselves to potential litigation if this goes forward with four units, because four units are not allowed in the B1 zoning district. And that has, that's in court now, it's, it's dragging out. It may well drag out to the point that the building permit is issued because that's, that's the issue right now about whether the plaintiffs will have to seek their injunction at the time the building permit uh, gets issued, should one be issued. Um, so I, I think the board uh, needs to step back and as some of the members have said, really reduce the parking, reduce the number of units to three units and you'll be in much better shape and can do something that fits with both the letter and the spirit of the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Please use the raise hand function. Okay, seeing none, we will close public comment for this docket. Um, let's see, and I will turn it back over to the board for discussion. Um, and maybe I will start by saying that I too share um, the concerns of, of Jean and David with regard to the reduction of, um, of office space. I, I think that the right number for this parcel um, of residential spaces, both given the parking and the number of existing office uses in order for it to still remain mixed use is the, the full first floor or two units being um, office space. Um, so I, I personally like to see that, that change before I, before I could support this. But I'm interested to hear what some of my colleagues have to say as well. Can you speak up? Ken? Please, Ken. Uh, well, I'm going to probably differ from all three of you guys and say that, look, this is an existing building. It's an existing mixed use building. Uh, they're asking is they're changing the proportion of what's mixed use to what is more in demand today. Just like how they changed it, changed it from 100% uh, housing to represent a portion of mixed use and office space back in the day when they asked for it. So I feel like I feel differently from you guys about this. And as far as applying all the, um, uh, the rules that we can on this, as, it's, as it is a, um, such as it is as a new, if it was a new project, a, a brand new big, big project, I think is unfair to the owner. I think they are keeping the character of the building the way it is. They're not changing anything outside. They're just making it such that they can make a living with what's in what's in below because that's what's in demand right now and they're adjusting uh, that proportion. So I'm fully supportive of that because of that. And you know, if, if we encourage owners to um, tear down buildings and make make big buildings and not and not have um, where, where there can be smaller buildings, which I think this is, then, um, you know, I don't think it's fair. I think we should encourage both. And where this one here is, you're just changing what's inside and changing the proportion of our mixed use, not making it become mixed use. It was mixed use to begin with. They're just changing the proportions. 
and we're just trying to make a better project there. That's what I'm trying to do, and that's what my feelings are. And it may be different from you guys, but that's where I'm where I'm standing. David, well, let let me just follow up on that. So, if on one of the other projects, uh, mixed use projects that we've approved, uh, where there was uh, a what we thought was a better mix of commercial and residential, um, you know what. Does that mean that years from now, uh, you know, the the ARB should be okay with, say, reducing the commercial space in those buildings to, you know, a de minimis commercial space, uh, and and letting it be almost entirely residential? I'm, you know, I'm not sure. That's what we intended with, with mixed use. I realize I realize that David, but. We also, we, uh, when we said that, those requirements, it was for a brand new development. It was a brand new project. And I think because the fact that this is an existing building, uh, they're not changing the character of the building outside. They're making a strong point not to do that and keeping the outside very similar to what was there before. And I think that has to be taken into account. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm willing to give them a little leadway on that. That's my feeling on that. Now, if the, the say the new building we, uh, we made requirements for in the future becomes more characteristic and it's more what the town's built out of. And they're saying that they want to make a few changes so they don't have to knock it down and put a new building up. I might think the same way too. If that building was to be like, a common building along Mass Ave or something like that. Uh, I'm just saying that we can't be so stringent a, a way of thinking on every single project. I think we have a latitude and we do have the latitude, the ability to uh, give a little slack in areas where we think is, we, uh, is justified. I'm not saying that it applies to all projects. And I mean, it may, it may well be that the, the current, commercial space in in this building is not a desirable form of commercial space uh, in Arlington at the moment. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, that's certainly possible. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly want to uh, think about making sure that buildings are being fully used to the extent possible. Um, I do think um, that the parking issue is, is is a can of worms, and I would I would advise the proponent to, uh, for one thing, uh, definitely not have more than five spaces uh, proposed because I think having more than five spaces uh, definitely subjects them to additional requirements that they that they can't meet. Uh, in in any way that I can see, um, and I, I am, I continue to be concerned about about the bike parking. And as some as 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 one of my colleagues mentioned, uh, Gene, I think if if we do keep the entire first floor as commercial, um, then that potentially is space on the first floor for there to be some, a, a roll in, roll out indoor bike parking facility that completely eliminates the need to, to lift the bikes, which, you know, does on the face of it, uh, violate the, the bicycle parking bylaw. You're muted. Gene, thoughts? Yeah, yeah I'll just, follow up briefly um you know i i appreciate what all my colleagues on on the board had to say you know as as um one of the owners pointed out i think ms pesciuto um the basement unit was a business unit and they had a lot of trouble renting it in part i guess at least because of its location in the building so they are proposing 
that to become residential, which makes a lot of sense to me and theoretically should be easier to rent out. Um, so that's one. Second is, I, I don't think we're asking them to do a lot to come back and say, you know, here's how we could configure the inside of the building without changing the outside, which seems to be one of their goals, to have the first floor be business. The basement can be one of the apartments. The other apartments can be on the, um, on the second floor where they're not proposing any changes. So it's basically reconfiguring the unit one, the basement unit, into um, residential and keeping the first floor as business and potentially reconfiguring it so that it would be um, more marketable as business. I think that solves problems with parking. It solves problems or can solve problems with the bicycle storage. And if they're talking about a really small lot, I think that's a better um, solution to this. And while I appreciate whenever uh, an applicant comes in with um, an idea for what they want to do with a building or a project, I think it's our job in part to take a look at that and see what would work. I don't, you know, I don't think we're intending to impose all of the requirements, let's say, on parking that, you know, both we and some of the public had talked about if we can get a solution to where they are now. And I think that part of the solution is um, reducing the number of parking spaces. And by reducing, by one, the residential unit, they're able to do that. So it is a trade-off. I'm just in a different place on the trade-off than Mr. Lau is. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Katie? Um, so I very much support Ken's perspective on this, and I, I share his view that I would feel really differently about this if this were, they were tearing this down and making some sort of brand new building um, where there'd be a lot more flexibility and where the parking was placed and what the layout looked like and all of those other issues. Um, I think given the constraint of keeping the building as it is, which I think is something that's desirable too. I mean, given the number of times we've heard concerns about teardowns um, in this town and you know, the presentations we've seen um, this fall about concerns about people's, uh, people's concerns about teardowns in this community, it seems to me like given that they are keeping the building as it is and facing that as a major constraint, um, we could afford them more flexibility in some of the other areas. Um, that said, if they, if they, you know, Jean's suggestion about potentially leaving the first floor as commercial space, if they come back and say that's viable, I would certainly support that. Um, but I, it is not for me um, a requirement. I, I support uh, the residential to commercial breakdown as it currently is. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I mean, nobody's telling them to tear this down and build another building. And in fact, the lot is so small that they would lose all their non-conforming um, benefits were they to tear it down and build another building and they'd have to deal with the historic society. So we're really not talking about they either get exactly what they want or they're gonna tear down the building. It's really more about do they get, they get exactly what they want or do they modify the inside in some ways that makes it easier for us or at least some of us to say yes. Just to clarify, I think I, I was commenting more some folks have said, um, compared this to other projects um, that they were more excited about that had breakdowns that they preferred that were new construction. Um, yeah. And so I think comparing those is not not a really fair comparison that this one is much more constrained. But yeah, I agree. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we can either um, move this to a to a vote or um, defer this to next week, um, Attorney Anessi. I, I know that at, at least Jean and I have expressed, um, you know, clearly that we'd like to see an additional um, office use unit in the in the building. I think um, David 
I'm, I'm not sure which, which way you're leaning at this point. Um, well, I, I think is that something you'd like to come back and, and explore and, and come back to us yeah. after reviewing? I'm certainly not tone deaf. Uh, I've listened and uh, I, I would want the opportunity to speak with my clients, confer with my clients and come back uh, again before the board and uh, perhaps uh, make a presentation before the board again. Great. Rachel, so, yes. I mean, I I, uh, I agree with you and Jean. Uh, I would feel uh, that it's it's easier for me to agree to this uh, if uh, they take a look at um, at a configuration that involves more commercial on the first floor because that that just avoids. Uh, a whole range of issues that are, are making me uncomfortable. If, uh, if, if in fact, uh, uh, David, that we, we do come back with more commercial on the first level, does that solve our problem uh, with respect to other issues that you may have in mind? Uh, for example, uh, I'm hopeful that we might be able to satisfy <coughs> indoor bike parking, but if we cannot, okay, uh, are we going to have some flexibility on that issue if we come back? I, I'm going to look at the project as, as a whole and as it's presented at that time. Uh, you know, I think that I, I see the potential to to solve uh, the balance of commercial and residential and providing better bike parking and uh, reducing, if not eliminating, the the parking problems um, by by coming back with another proposal. But I, I'll look at it all afresh. Uh, when, when I, I need it. to sell this to my client and I <laughs> need to know that I'm not playing Don Quixote. That's the reason I'm asking, okay? Yeah. All right, all right. I, I get your, your point. Okay, so in order to continue this to a future hearing, I think we need to identify um, a, a date. Um, so, Aaron or Jenny, if you could pull up the calendar of our next date. I think we have one in two weeks. Rachel. But I'm not sure when our first January meeting is. The next meeting is the 21st. So you need to have um, everything to Jenny a week. Uh, Ken, do, uh, what's your schedule like? Can we do that once we have a discussion with the clients? Ken, are you there? Hello? Well, all right. Uh, when will we have to have everything to Jenny? I, a week prior a to week the 21st. Prior to December 21st, okay. So next, uh, next, next week. week. Next week. Uh, well, why don't we take that date? And uh, if, uh, again, Ken is not, I can't confer with Ken. Uh, if, uh, Ken is not available. Can I request a continuance at that point? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, put it down for December 21st and let's see what happens. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So I think we need a um, motion from the board to continue um, continue this uh, agenda item to December 21st. Um, so moved. Continue docket 3638 to December 21. Second. Okay, we'll take a roll call for the vote. Uh, Ken? Ken, you're muted, we can't hear you. Thank you, Jean. No. Uh, David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? No. And I vote yes. So we will continue docket 3638 to December 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so the next item on our agenda is uh, docket 2717, which is a continued public hearing as amended for uh, 23 Broadway. And uh, do we have the applicant with us? Uh, yes, Attorney Mary Winstanley O'Connor, 
the SCAR LLC. Also with me are the principals, Michael Aldi and Michael Honeywell, as well as the architects, John Olivetto and Georges Claremont are also available to answer any questions of the board as well. Great, thank you. Rachel, can I just step away for one minute? Uh, please go ahead, we'll take, um, we'll take a couple of minutes uh, before we begin, let's take three minutes. Is that okay, Ken? Perfect. I'll go to for three minutes. Katie, are you back with us? There we are. Okay, great. I appreciate, um, Mary, I appreciate you um, bearing with us if you and your, your team wanted to go ahead and get started. Certainly, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. First, first let me thank the board for their time and I'd like to uh, thank the planning department, Erin and Jenny, for all of their assistance. Uh, since the last hearing, we have provided additional um, plans and filings, and I'll just uh, review them and the architects can answer any questions. You have a revised site plan, which shows on-site parking uh, spaces, wayfaring signage, bicycle parking, the style of the bicycle racks that the board wanted to see. Um, and uh, it also shows the existing stairs. There was a question, there were a couple of questions that Jenny recently raised. The existing stairs onto Broadway are totally on the property. They do not encroach on the public way and that's established through the site plan. Uh, we also provided information. Uh, the board wanted to see something different with respect to the block wall. Uh, so we provided some uh, materials proposed uh, for that. Uh, we've revised the plans uh, uh, for the interior employee bicycle parking. Um, We've provided a memo, two memos from Vanessa, our transportation consultant, with respect um, to parking issues that the board raised and also in response to the comments from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, and I can address those, but I'm sure that the board has read them. Uh, the bottom line is that there's uh, uh, no uh, significant impact. Uh, one of the things that TAC wanted um, the transportation consultant to look at was in addition to the ITE information um, concerning a marijuana dispensary, something in Massachusetts that was local. So they used Millbury and they've incorporated that information into uh, the November 30th report. Uh, we've also created a centralized, one of the things that the board wanted was a centralized document with all of the recommendations of the traffic consultant and the transportation demand management plan. Um, you can see from the TAC comments 
that they concur with all of the recommendations of Vaness, um, and uh, we're prepared to implement those. Uh, one of the things that TAC recommended that uh, the uh, there be a right turn only out of the parking lot onto Sunnyside. Um, there's our consultant has concluded that there's not a substantial change in overall intersection operation. Now the reality is um, based, and you can see from the, the study, that intersection of Alewife and Broadway operates at F. Um, it already is operating at F, it can't get any worse. Uh, but however, there would be one or two additional queuing of vehicles in that area. Uh, they, our consultant has determined that uh, the projected uh, related traffic increase over no build conditions are projected to range between eight to 16 vehicles during the weekday evening peak hours. Uh, and he does not view that as significant. TAC has requested um, certain uh, recommendations that we're prepared to um, implement as well. One of them being that we go to the Board of Selectmen, which we would have to do to get those three spaces in front of the uh, property designated as for ride share. And my clients are prepared to do that and incur that expense. Um, there are 12 spaces in the lot, but this property is fairly unique. I, I think everybody could agree that this property is fairly unique in comparison to other properties in town. It is probably one of the only areas where there is ample on-street parking. There are about 60 spaces of on-street parking. It's a substantially different situation than the issues presented at 1386 Mass Ave, where you have, um, you don't have that uh, ample on-street parking. Um, in any event, you know, one of the things that Jenny had requested was the interior circulation plan, and we did uh, provide the interior circulation plan. Now it calls for 16 total people on the floor with a waiting room. This of course was pre-COVID and will be post-COVID of 50 people. Um, that would be more than ample. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, the architects have done the calculation and the waiting room can only include 11 people. Now the reality is, um, just like all the other businesses in town, people are going to queue up on the sidewalk. So the question during COVID, uh, because of the social distancing and the limited limitations, the issue becomes having a staff member or someone in place out there to make sure that it is orderly and safe. Um, the uh, other uh, issue with respect to uh, what, what we would suggest is that the Arlington Police Department be involved in connection with um, uh, working with the applicant as to how that best should be done uh, and any uh, parking uh, queuing and the like. We, I would suggest that they would work with them on that and we can dedicate staff um, to assisting with that as well. But because of, if, if this was not the pandemic, you'd have 16 people on the floor and 50 in the waiting area. So you'd have a total of 66 people, which would be more than adequate. Um, I can uh, have the, uh, unless you have specific questions, I would, uh, ha I can ask the architects to address some of the concerns that uh, you, you have um, with respect to uh, the space facilities. There is, there is no space for a shower on site. Uh, they do propose a break room uh, and they can talk about the lead scorecard. So I would uh, defer to them if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. Okay. John or George? George, did you want to take that? Are there any questions that uh, that the committee would like to uh, have addressed first? Uh, if, if there's no specific presentation, I'd, I'd be happy to move um, move right into into questions uh, for you, unless there's anything specific from the um, documents submitted that you'd like to present to us. Yeah, I can. I think we. Hi, this is John and John Olivetto. I'm partnered with AEPMI. 
Um, one thing that should be corrected, Mary, is uh, George and I reviewed the calculations for the waiting room and the number is, it goes up a little bit from 11 to 14. Oh, okay. So that is a minor correction. Maybe, uh, Madam Chair, the best way is to respond to questions because the board has all the detailed information. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate the presentation and the time that you took to uh, prepare this, this resubmission. So thank you all very much. I'll move first to, uh, to Katie. No, thank you for this really thorough presentation. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. I look forward to hearing um, what my board mem fellow board members and uh, members of the public have to say. Thank you, Katie. Jean? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for all the updated material. I just have a few questions. When you were last here, we had some discussion about whether the exit was a set of steps and therefore was not um, handicap accessible or whether it is handicap accessible and if it's not handicap accessible, how the circulation would work for someone in a wheelchair. For example, um, it looks to me, and maybe I'm not reading this correctly, that there are still steps and so the exit is not handicap accessible, is that correct? Well, um, the way we've addressed it, uh, okay. we have addressed it. Um, the typical uh, uh, day of operations, the retail exit is used by most patrons. All patrons enter off the parking lot side on Broadway. Okay, so what we've, what we've provided during normal operations is a handicap accessible door back out through the waiting area that would be addressed by any, any staff member. This, for controlled access, this door would be closed almost at all times, unless there was someone in a wheelchair. Okay, yeah, that wasn't clear from uh, last time, so it's helpful to understand. Now, in, case of, in case of an event, uh, an emergency, what we've provided um, at the retail exit is an area of refuge with a call for aid. So in case there's a fire uh, at the other end of the building, this allows uh, a first responder to be alerted when there, there's an individual in, in a wheelchair that, uh, that needs to be attended to. And based on the occupant load, we're only required to have one. Jenny, can you scroll down a little bit, please? And George, just, just to add to what you were saying, um, I think the board, um, I just wanted to point out that the, the double door design is something we added per the board's feedback um, to allow the handicap, um, to have a handicap access point to leave the retail for. That, that Mike, was we, a change from the last iteration. And Mike, I think the, the other additional change is actually the area of refuge at the retail Correct. exit. Yes. So, so there were, there were, um, we did take into consideration feedback from the board and, and made the, those were the two uh, major changes that we made in the design. Okay. Correct. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, no, no worries. Pardon? No, I said, no, you're welcome. <laughs> um, uh, second is, um, so the lead checklist, you were going to get us an updated lead checklist, but I don't think you did. I believe yeah, that, the checklist did not change, John. That is correct, Mary and uh, Jean. When we looked at the uh, available points, we fell short of the minimum threshold at the certified level. Um, we did think that there were some credits available at, in the maybe column or the questionable column. Um, but however, those, those areas for additional credits would involve changing out HVAC units uh, and the like to try and garner some additional credits. Um, this is a leased facility. The infrastructure is what it is and would, um, would cost uh, time and effort and money to our client. Okay. Um, third question. So I, the news the other day included that the um, cannabis, cannabis, cannabis Control Commission 
voted to allow home delivery of product. And I wondered whether there was going to be any home delivery made from this facility. So I, I, I guess I can take that. Um, for one, it's, I, I think that decision is, is highly dependent on the town's regulations. We don't, um, one, for one, we're not, we're not allowed to own any aspect of those delivery services yet, and they still have to define those services over the next few months. So as you know, they have the courier and the uh, delivery model. Some of that is um, specifically for wholesale delivery, not just retail delivery. Um, as soon as those become clear when they'll be issuing those permits and how those impacts, and as you know, a lot of towns were um, upset that some of the feedback it, uh, was not provide, they did not provide feedback or were able to give the appropriate feedback they wanted. Um, so the answer, I guess the answer is we don't, we don't know because we're not really sure how the regulations are going to shape out. And we would obviously default to the town on whatever their, their rules are with those regulations. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. I, I would think, I'll sort of raise this to my colleagues that that maybe we would put something in the permit that says if they intend to do delivery from the facility, they have to come back to get the permit revised because that may make a difference in parking, traffic, things that I can't even consider. So I don't think we have to deal with it now other than maybe just put a condition in the permit that indicates they'd have to come back if they wanted to do delivery for a change in the permit condition. Those are all the questions I had. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Ken. Well, thank, you, thank you for coming back with uh, these new documents. Um, I do want to mention uh, thanks for the change from the block wall between the two entrances at the, uh, off the parking lot. Uh, I guess the owner really doesn't want um, a, a, a big separation there because he changed it to a, a steel grate. Um, I, I was think, envisioning more of a, you know, a planting bed, you know, very a softer um, separation, but um, if that's what he wants, I'm not going to push it much further than that. So, so uh, Kim, we did look at vegetation um, as an option. It just it didn't look like it would survive in those conditions being because it's a it's a shaded overhang um and it would be a small area for planting so it was unfortunately kind of the the best route we could go um it, you know so we tried that we tried to present options if 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 there's if they feel if there's something that you feel strongly about that's not a huge change we're, we're obviously open to it even after this i mean it's a it's a small you know, it's a, it's a small change. We just want to, that was, the property owner was just very adamant about keeping it separate. It's, it's his building. I, you know, we, uh, we don't I, I don't feel, I don't feel strongly about it, Michael. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm just commenting on the fact that, you know, it's still quite a steel barrier, you know? Yeah. No, I, uh, I understand. I mean, we, you know, there's not a lot of property owners that, that would even talk to us about having a store in these areas and, and, so, I mean, over the steel barrier, it, it was just something we couldn't push given how much they've been willing to concede to let us just do business in their building. So, I'm not gonna push it. Okay, uh, I appreciate uh, that, Ken. Um, the other thing is uh, you presented these nice uh, decorative glass films. Can you explain where they're gonna go? Or what are you gonna use which ones for? Oh, those were just, those were options. Uh, uh, the, the, well, it's a three M. Which, which ones do you like? Well, so uh, Ken, I, from what I from what I remember in the last meeting, the the board um, the board wasn't too keen on the mat or the just the pure gray finish. So I mean, we again we tried to produce. This isn't like a 
deal breaker for us on design. So we tried to present options. Um, if there's certain options that you guys feel strongly about one way or the other, you know, we're obviously more than happy to accommodate. And are um, you, so we try uh, to come up with it, some different. Ken, yep. are, you, are you asking where these films would be applied? Well, I'm assuming they're going to be uh, applied at the windows along the front of the, the, front of the building. But which ones? I mean, there's like a handful there to select from, and they vary all over the place. I'm going to step away from this for a little bit because uh, it's actually was Rachel's uh, comment uh, from the last meeting that uh, she, she asked you guys to look at some of the, the stuff. So I'll let her. Um, she can pick. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm searching <laughs> a, a suggestion or two, but I'm, I'm going to leave it at that, okay? So that part's fine. And um, I appreciate the fact that you show that the steps are no longer uh, across the property line. Um, I guess there's a, two, there's a two foot buffer between the building and a property line and the two steps come out 11 inches each. So you're two inches shy. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys have an area of refuge over that second egress. Uh, and um, there's two ways out uh, from there. So uh, I'm, all the questions I had was pretty much um, answered. The, the only last thing that I had there was um, a dedicated uh, loading sign uh, in, in the, you had two parking spots saying loading zone on your site plan. Are you driving Jenny or are they driving? I am. Okay. Uh, right there it says proposed loading area. There's two parking spots there. Can you have some sort of signage, signage there saying from this time to this time or just designate it as a loading zone so uh, a truck won't be loading in the driveway? Uh, just parked, in, parked right along that driveway there blocking the entrance while they load, unload uh, material. That's the only request I have besides all the other questions that, uh, that I, I thank you for. Um, I don't can't, I can't I don't think that's an unreasonable request. I think we're we're more than happy to label the, the loading hours with a sign in the back there. Um, yeah, I mean that's I think that's completely reasonable. You just don't want a truck parking in that driveway. That's no, all. It's, un it's understood. It's understood. Okay. I'm all set, uh, Rachel. Thank you, Ken. David. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, well, I appreciate uh, that you all have addressed many of our questions from from last time. Uh, with respect to uh, to bike parking, um, can we take a look at both where the bike parking is and what type of racks are being proposed? So I think I, I see here on the on the site plan uh, outdoor. Um, so that's temporary bike parking. And where where is the? Oh, do you mean uh, internal, David? Yeah, where's the longer term and? Uh, I think we have that in the located? design. In uh, I know where it is. It's on. It's outside the retail place. Oh wait, I think it. I think it was up a little bit. Yeah. Yep. It was. Scroll up. Yeah. It should be near it's, like. Um, we retrofitted one of the uh, existing closets to make a uh, bike. No, not area not down, down slightly, Jenny. Yeah, right there. And can you and, center and over that on bit. the right? It'd be over to the right. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. So how how is where is that exactly? <laughs> <laughs> For the uh, where is the when you walk in? So you so you have to remember, David, when you most of the. A large part of the building is um, outside the retail space. Um, right. When you walk in, there's actually a, a large series of rooms um, that the property owner just wished that they weren't um, kind of, even though we rent out that space, uh, they made it clear he didn't want like certain areas for, for loitering. So like there's bathrooms for our employees if they want to use it, there's a, there's a closet in there. Uh, and so we used a bunch of those rooms for kind of these extra amenities for staff, like um, like being able to uh, leave their bikes and, and, and such. Okay. 
All right, so that makes sense. So that's that's entered entirely separately from the retail space. Right. Yeah. And this is and this is for employees mostly. Yeah. It was just that was you know so they they specifically Jimmy wanted to specific the property owner specifically um, as part of us uh, leasing out he just requested that we didn't have customers in that area so we got creative with the design but still allowed access to our employees to all the necessities and it's okay. it's still a pretty large area if you go into that into that building um, yeah so there should be ample room okay. And the note there indicates that those are uh, are U-shaped uh, bike racks, which uh, if they're the typical inverted U, that's that's certainly acceptable, and would provide parking for up to up to four bikes. Um, uh, I I thought I saw a reference to another style of bike rack somewhere. Is there a different style proposed for the short term? Bike racks. There's a there's a detail on the uh, site drawings. Yeah, Bolo uh, provided my, that. Yeah, my my concern was with those that I I think if you if you look at the town's uh, bicycle parking guide, uh, not just the bylaw, but the whole bike parking guide that the planning department has. Um, I think you'll see that the the style of rack that is proposed is is not recommended, and and so I'd I'd like you to take a look at at picking another style that that does comply with the town's bike parking guidelines. Okay, we will do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate that you you found an interior space. Um, for uh, for employee bike parking, that's that's very preferable. Um, so um, I did uh, read through a lot of the uh, uh, traffic and and parking analysis, and uh, you know I, I I think that uh, the overall conclusion is that this will not significantly impact. Um, the operation of, of the nearby intersections. Um, I did note that there was some potential uh, for queuing on Sunnyside to extend beyond the exit driveway for the building um, uh, during, during the peak hour, I think. Um, so uh, there, there may be some difficulty in people getting out of, of the parking lot uh, at that time, potentially. One thing I was thinking of, though, is in, since there is so much on-street parking available nearby, um, I was thinking about what is what is the best use of the on-site parking that that you have now, and how best to manage that. And one thing I was thinking about, um, uh, and this. this Goes along with the with the whole issue of um, handicapped access to the retail space, and I, I do see you have one one of the spaces marked as a handicapped space. I'm wondering uh, if uh, it might be worthwhile uh, to designate at least one other space as a handicapped space as well. Uh, to provide uh, even more accessibility for handicapped customers. And I'm, I'm thinking um, uh, because a, a, I'd say a not insignificant number of people with disabilities um, uh, make use of your product. I think um, that would be fine, Michael, correct? You're muted. I, I, can you say that again, Mary? Uh, uh, David is suggesting a second handicap space in the lot, and I think that's fine. Okay, good. Yeah, so I was going to say I'd had to punt to you because I don't know if there's any. I mean, sure, we're more, we're obviously more than happy to. Um, and I, I, I agree with you, David. I think most of it will be, you know, kind of that on-street parking. So it would be nice to dedicate that those areas. 
I just didn't I, I I just had to punt to Mary because I didn't know if there was like a a zoning repercussion or something like that that I just didn't know. Well, that about. yeah, I'm 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 kind of thinking off the top of my head here, so definitely do want to make sure that that wouldn't cause you a problem unnecessarily. But I, I think from a customer perspective, it would be a nice thing. Yeah, we, there's there's um, there's no reason that that would be an issue. We'd yeah. be more than happy to. As long, so, you know, barring a legal issue with the zone or something. I, I don't see right. Issue. So I'm just thinking of the, of the circulation through the parking lot because just knowing the way people think, uh, if there is on a park, um, people generally want to try a park as close to the front door of a building as they can. So I'm thinking that most people, when they show up, are going to pull into the parking lot and hope there's a space there so that i'm thinking there's going to be a significant amount of circulation just through the parking lot um, particularly if it's busier and there are no spaces so people circling through coming out on sunny side and then only then parking on the street and that seems like uh, I, I don't think that the traffic analysis really looked at that issue. And I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit concerned about it because I think it's a likely scenario, just given human behavior. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, whether um, there's a way to manage it better to really encourage people to make use of the on-street parking. Um, you know, if I could say this, David, the lot is so small that I think when people pull up, they'll be able to eyeball um, whether there's any available. It's not like it's the stop and shop parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's, it's so small that I think you're going to get more people pulling up um, uh, on the Broadway side, on the side of the building and just pa parallel parking on the street as opposed to pulling in. Well, is, as part of the uh, parking and, and queue management, um, and I think we, we, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've actually seen a, a written plan for that, but um, is the intention to at least in the beginning to have a staff member outside who can direct people? Yes. Okay, so that, that at least until people kind of get used to how things operate, I think would, would alleviate my concern with that because presumably that person could uh, could wave people off from entering the parking lot or put a cone across it or something if it was full. Um, I mean, are, are, you, are you intending to provide us with, um, with a plan uh, a written plan for for managing the the parking and queuing. Well, I I talked to our traffic consultant, and frankly, he said there really wasn't much of a plan that he could prepare other than having a staff member outside managing the the parking, um, blocking yeah. off the parking lot if it was full, or waving people yeah. along um, to park and on it, the street. And it sounds like in a in a non COVID time, that there's not not at all concern with uh with the queue spilling out onto the sidewalk I, I that is correct okay yeah we David, we designed um the retail space the floor space not the retail space um prior to covid with the idea that it, there wouldn't be um queues outside and so we actually designed it to make sure that that's the case with with the two separate okay. floor areas Okay. Yeah, I mean, given, given the traffic analysis and the fact that you have designed the indoor space um, uh, specifically to avoid outdoor queues, um, I'm, it, and you're, you've stated that you're intending to, to have a, a staff member outside, um, at least during the initial to to manage whatever is going on um, I'm, I'm not sure how much more detail uh, we really need on that um, 
Um, but uh, if any of my colleagues have, have questions on it, I'm sure they'll ask. Um, I didn't really have any other comments. Uh, I mean, my only other question was about the handicapped access uh, at the exit, and, and I think you've addressed that. Great. Thank you, David. Um, so I just had three minor questions or comments. Um, so the, the first being um, with regard to the, since we're on the parking plan, um, Jenny, if you could just scroll up towards the egress onto Sunnyside. Oh, sorry, still in that same plan. <laughs> right there, perfect. Um, I, I think per the, um, per the original traffic um, report, it was actually, sorry, the section of, there you go, right there. Um, there was, they had recommended a painted stop um, you know, the, the word stop, so the painted white stop um, sign on the on the egress portion there before you turn onto Sunnyside, is that? That's correct, correct? Yeah. So is that something you will be adding? Yes, I know that was one of the other items. Yes. Okay, great. Um, my next question, um, or actually is a request, if we go to the page with the screen, and actually both of my questions are about the glass treatment and then the screen itself. Um, I appreciate, as Ken mentioned, you looking at a different option for the, for the screen, um, which I think is on the, the detail is on the page prior to this. Yes, so my only request here, and again, because it, it just, Again, it's such kind of a difficult barrier <laughs> um, as opposed to um, you know, what we were originally talking about doing, trying to soften it a little bit. It, rather than just having that as kind of a galvanized screen, which I think is what you're showing now, if you could perhaps just powder coat it to match the storefront framing, um, you know, again, that'll just make it look less like some sort of an industrial metal screen which is what we were trying to stay away from. Is that something you'd be willing to consider? Uh, yes, we could actually match the new storefront, which will Perfect. match the existing. Um, from a design standpoint, this is a uh, metal fabric screen, and we're actually using it within the, the retail store. So the thought okay. process was to actually provide the, um, from a design standpoint, was to provide the patron with a foreshadowing as well of the retail experience. Um, initially, the, uh, the, um, the property owner wanted to segregate the two populations. Uh, and we thought, okay, well, but he also wanted transparency. Um, so that, and we thought, okay, well, let's, let's just bring the experience from the inside out uh, there, there are different ways that we could do this. This is um, stainless steel, um, and it's it's doesn't show as well on the rendering or on the drawing, but it's actually a high-end uh, material. Uh, we could select one that that uh, that matches the the bronze, uh, the dark bronze color of the of the new storefront. Uh, no, I think if it's possible, perhaps if you could um, just email to Jenny if you have any more, maybe a photograph of showing what this material looks like that, you know, I think it might just, to your point, it may just not be rendering yeah. um, the way that we'd all like to see it. So it, it, perhaps if you could just um, send on a photograph, we can just take a, a quick look at that. But um, that, right. it's great to know that there is some sort of a language that's speaking between the interior and exterior here. So that's, that's great to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last question I had was specifically on which glass, which glass treatment you, you were all leaning towards, because there are quite a few options which all have very different aesthetics. Um, and my initial thought in looking at this was that, you know, even if it's perhaps a mix of some of the more decorative items, I know you have that curved area storefront there on the, on the corner. If, you know, perhaps there were some of the more decorative elements that are used, whether it's on that three window bay and then more of the fritted glass treatment um, on the on the balance or you know again I, I just wanted to hear your thought um, on how you were what you were leaning towards and how you were looking at using these well I being from the Caribbean I wanted the colorful one <laughs> okay 
But then I thought, well, let's just present some options from the more uh, uh, the more reserved, all right, to the to the more fun. So what you're seeing is pretty much the whole range. But the first thing I touched was the the more colorful pattern. Um, and uh, you know we are in the Northeast, and some some folks might you know they kind of uh, avoid color. Um, so what we're we're showing is the is the entire range. So what what fits your brand the best? If you had, you know what I each one of none of these is objectionable to me whatsoever. I love the color. I think it's I think it's interesting. It's eye catching. Um, but again, what what fits your brand? The Escar brand that that's what I would suggest you 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 move towards. Got it. Uh, and again, no, you, don't what, what, have, you, you don't have to you know decide <laughs> right now. You can work through this with you know Jenny after this project is is approved. But you know, like I said, if if you do choose the cup the color, my my thought was initially let's you know, perhaps use that on the, the corner, you know, or, you know, some prominent area and then perhaps back it off and by using some of the more fritted glass options on some of the other windows and so that you have a little bit of variation in your facade. But I, I do appreciate that you went there and um, I, I actually like the, the color option. But again, I would rather you use something that expresses the brand and, you know, what, what you're trying to achieve throughout the, the full um, aesthetic that you're, that you're incorporating on the interior and how you might bring that, bring that outward. Understood. Yeah, Rachel, I, I mean, so, you know, our brand is obviously kind of like an outgoing, the idea of Escar, at least from what the inside, what we've tried to put together is kind of this outgoing, outdoors, non-corporate feel to like this event. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, my wife doesn't even let me pick my own clothes. So I'm gonna have to default to George on a lot of these style choices. <laughs> so I can't tell you if the, I mean, so so if you feel strongly or George, you obviously feel strongly one way or another, we'll obviously default to you guys. Cause I mean, certainly George, I mean, you, you know, you designed, you designed most of the space. It, it looks amazing. So, you know, we'll obviously trust you one way or the other. All right. Um, what what we'll do is we'll get, we'll get our heads together, and I, I will send um, some options uh, to Jenny. Great. And uh, the two mics will will have a conversation as to uh, how to make make everything uh, come together. Okay. Great. Great. And like I said, I do like the direction that you're heading here. I think that it's graphic. It's bold. It's what we want people to to incorporate in their in their windows when you have the restrictions that you do as a cannabis retail establishment. So thank you for for pulling for, for pulling this type of inspiration. It's refreshing. You're welcome. Great. Um, are there any other questions from the board before we open this up for public comment? Great. Uh, so we will now open uh, the the meeting up to public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak, please use the raised hand function. As a reminder, please uh, state your name and address before you begin to speak, and then you will have three minutes to address any comments. The first speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I'd like to call our option two. Um, I only have one comment about this. Uh, it's a small one regarding the handicap parking spot. Um, if I understand state law, when there's only a single handicap space, it has to be van accessible, which means that the access aisle on the side of it, instead of being five feet wide, has to be eight feet wide. Uh, I thought David Watson made some very good comments about adding a second handicap space. And if you were to do that, you could share that access aisle between the two spaces and save a little room. Um, that's really all I have to say. It's obviously a very well thought out proposal. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to speak on this docket? 
Very well, we will close public comments. Um, any other questions or comments from the board? All right, seeing none. Um, all right, let me get back to my agenda here. Too many things open. Okay, there we go. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we will probably be ready for a, a motion uh, to move this, this forward, a motion to approve, unless there are any other objections um, from the board. And I want to make sure that we word any motion with any um, conditions that were stated. And the only ones that I have that I think would need to be stated as a condition, um, Jean, was the item that you had stated about any um, change to the operating status to include to include new services such as home delivery would require a um, a change to the to the permit condition and a reopening of the special permit okay yeah i just yes let me just the the other things i just wonder whether they need to be in here or not or some of the um responses they've done to the TAC, things like the stop sign, the, the shared spaces out front. Do the, I don't know uh, whether those need to be conditions in the permit or not. I don't, Jenny, I'll, I'll defer to you, but I think from a technical standpoint, I don't think that those need to be conditions of the permit. They're just noted for revision, correct? Correct. Okay. And I'll just put something about this comment you have, Jean, about uh, the uh, delivery. So we, we need to amend the zoning bylaw to allow for that type of uh, use. It's not allowed right now. And okay. then further, the host community agreement would have to be updated. So the applicant would actually have to go back to the select board regardless, as well as to the Cannabis Control Commission to probably amend whatever uh, you know, well, the regulations are still being finalized. Let me We're actually start there. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I, you know, that's why I think it's important to just put something in this that yeah, says they have to come back to I was going to, to end with, too. it's harmless to do that, but it's also, um, it's a little bit ahead of ourselves uh, to put it into a permit where it's not even allowed right now. But I wanted to outline for the board that it is something that actually we're going to be talking about on Wednesday night uh, when we talk about other zoning amendments uh, that are needed and this one will be needed and once we have the regulations from the state <laughs> we'll know what we can actually do the buffer zones have also changed so thank you jenny David? Uh, but i don't i don't the the uh, tac doesn't need to be in the i'm i'm looking at the recommendations right now i don't think that uh, anything needs to be amended in our decision thank you david uh well this was, I think, a question for Jenny, uh, which is, uh, you know, given everything we've discussed, um, do we still need to have, for our purposes, a written parking and queue management plan? Or uh, I note that in the proposed special conditions um, that talks about working with the police department and town council and minimizing or eliminating impacts on the neighborhood. I mean, perhaps we could include specifically any traffic or queuing issues that arise, but I would ask you if that was sufficient, Jenny. David, I believe that special condition number one would capture that and that as part of the MOU with the goal of minimizing and eliminating impacts on the neighborhood surrounding the facility would capture uh, the issue of queue management, um, though at the same time, if you think it needs to be specifically called out, that's separate, but it would be uh, something that we would review as part of that MOU. I, I would like um, to specifically uh, reference um, um, traffic parking and queue management uh, in that, in that in that particular condition, um, particularly since in this case, we're not requiring a written plan for that. Okay. 
okay? So that's uh, special conditions as amended. Uh, any other special conditions that we would like to add to the general conditions and special conditions as proposed by the Department of Planning and Community Development? Oh, also um, uh, work with the department uh, to make sure that the all of the bicycle parking is compliant with our bicycle parking guidelines. Okay. And just before, um, I'm going to skip back to the last one for a second, David. I, I'm just looking at special condition number three actually says queuing is prohibited in any public right of way. So I wonder if that's actually the one that needs to be amended uh, related to the queue management rather uh, than number one. You, you may be right, especially because of COVID, there may be no option uh, but to queue uh, along alongside the building. Um, yep. Maybe we say if during the pandemic, um, queuing will be permitted along the building. Or maybe queuing will be prohibited. Uh, maybe leave it and just add, uh, you know, except as, as otherwise agreed with, with APD or the town or something like that. Well. And leave it more general. Well, if the police say no queuing, what do we do with people because of COVID? Well, this is being addressed right now with with the current facility, um, you know, in Arlington Heights. So I, I don't I don't see that as being an issue, although I think it's OK to reference except as otherwise allowed. Um, that might be the easiest way out um, from it. But it, it's just this is a this is a special permit that lives with the property forever beyond right. the pandemic. Right. <laughs> so I want to be careful what what the clause is here that's allowing you to do it um, when otherwise it's prohibited. So well, maybe we you, maybe you cue it right into um, the public health issue right now. Well, while the social distancing guidelines are in effect, you know, may something to that effect that will limit it. And you won't have to worry about um, when there are no longer social distancing requirements in effect, there'd be no queuing. I mean, that works for me, but <laughs> it's up to the board. Yeah, I think if we're, if we're specific to social distancing requirements as opposed to specifically tying it to the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, that I, I would be more in favor of that. Okay, so we have um, special condition number three as amended. Um, the condition added to, um, related to home delivery, which again, we, we know we're out in front of. Um, were there any other special conditions that we needed to add? The bike, the bike parking. And the bike parking. That's right, work with the department to ensure all bike parking is compliant with guidelines. Okay, uh, so do we have a motion to approve docket uh, number 2717 uh, and as amended number 2905? Um, with the general conditions and special conditions as proposed by the Department of Planning and Community Development and as amended per our discussion. So moved. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I'd like to thank the board and the planning department for all of their help with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Great. So those that closes uh, our two docket numbers, and the uh, next item on our agenda is the review of meeting minutes. So the first.
uh, set of meeting minutes is the October 19th, 2020 meeting. And I'll just take a roll call vote to see if anyone has any uh, amendments or changes to the meeting minutes. We'll start with Jean, since I see your hand up. I do have some. Um, Attorney Anessi's name is misspelled um, throughout the entire document, so that should be fixed. On, on the second page, um, where is this one sec? There, there's one um, sentence that says, Mr. Benson agreed, period, but it doesn't say what he agreed with. And I think what he agreed was, he agreed to see the proposed changes at a future meeting. Do you see what that is, Jenny? And then um, two lines down, I think it should say, open to add either a shower or charge for parking. So the word of should be or. And two paragraphs down from there, um, I didn't quite understand what that meant. It says, after the electric vehicle parking station, it then says possible parking beyond one space. And I don't know what that means. I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> Hold on. I mean, the re I understood the rest of the paragraph, but just that one clause, possible parking beyond one space. Um, maybe more than one electrical ve electric vehicle parking space? I, I don't I don't know what it did refer to I don't know uh, this is the chair speaking actually so Rachel do you have Going a recollection? My notes. <laughs> I'm inclined inclined to delete that unless you are stuck with it want it I don't remember anything specific. I, deleting is fine because I couldn't figure out what it meant. I was thinking it was electric vehicles, but it doesn't make sense. So I'm not sure. Sorry. And then on the next page, um, the second paragraph, it says the chair closed public comment requested a motion for approval. And then it says Mr. Lau seconded. It doesn't say who made the motion. Do you see that? Yeah, I don't know who it is. <laughs> You could Sorry. just say the motion was made and seconded. And yeah, not put in Mr. I think we'll have to say that. Yeah. So I went back so, to my notes and Jean, you had actually asked for um, potentially uh, charging stations for more than one parking space. Okay. Okay, so, maybe so that's what that it was. In. Okay. <laughs> okay, and those were the, thank you, Rachel. So those were the ch changes I found for this, these minutes. Thank you, Jean. Kim? Yes. Um, we're talking October 19th, right? Yes. Yeah, it says, uh, uh, Mr. Lau, uh, he supports the entire ground floor as office space. That's not true. Um, can you tell me where that was again? I'm sorry, I was correcting. To yeah, the it's probably thing. like the third, pa fourth paragraph. It says, Mr. Lau stated that per code, four or more units would trigger an accessible requirement, but would leave the code enforcement to decide. He's, he supports the entire ground floor as office space. That is not, a, that was never a statement for me. I never said I supported the ground floor as office space, the whole entire ground floor. Do you, do you want it to be deleted? Yes. Okay. Someone else might've said that, but it was not from, it did not come from me. Got it. Anything? Was that all? Uh, for this for this one, yes. Okay, okay. I I have when the meeting started at seven p.m. instead of seven. Right. Good point. Okay, and it's actually for all three. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> These uh, were done by our tr transcription service, by the way. Um, yeah, they were different. I could tell. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, Apologies for not finding these finer points. No problem. Uh, uh, Katie? Okay, I changed that. 
Nope. David? Nothing beyond what my colleagues have. Thanks, Katie. And I'll, if Anessi is spelled incorrectly in all of these, I'll just find and replace that all throughout all of them. So. Um, the only other thing I had is on page two in the, the paragraph that starts, Mr. Benson agreed. Mm -hmm. In the middle of that, it says, Mr. Benson stated this would satisfy David's TDM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would make more sense if it's the TDM concerns. Right. <laughs> that does make uh, more sense. I think the rest of it is OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other comments for the meeting minutes from October 19th, 2020? All right. Do I hear a motion to approve the meeting minutes from October 19th, 2020 as amended? So moved. So motioned. Second. Okay, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you. So moving on to the meeting minutes from October 22nd, 2020. Any corrections here other than the time to 7 p.m.? Jean, no, Ken, no. David, Katie. All right, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the October 22nd, 2020 uh, meeting minutes as amended? Go ahead, Jean. <laughs> so moved. Go ahead, Ken. <laughs> All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I am yes as well. Uh, the next item is the October 26th, 2020 meeting minutes. Uh, the only amendment I have is again changing the time to 7 p.m. Are there any other changes? All right, seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the October 26, 2020 meeting minutes as amended? Yes, so motion. I'll second. Great, uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you for getting us through all those minutes. Uh, let's see, so the next item on our agenda is the 2021 uh, meeting schedule. Jenny, did you want to take us through? It's your meeting schedule, really just through the first six months of the year. Uh, normally I do a meeting schedule for the entire year, but um, actually I was looking to see the select board did their schedule tonight just for three months. <laughs> so um, I think six months is best for us just because we often have hearings and there's a lot to be scheduled in advance. Um, but at this moment in time, you know, we're still operating remotely. My best guess is that we'll continue to operate remotely through the spring, um, unfortunately, uh, for meetings. I don't know about when other things might start changing a little bit, but um, uh, if we want to continue to meet the way that we have been meeting, moving them a little bit earlier than when we were meeting in person, um, to seven, but uh, basically keeping, you know, the, the, the challenges, I think uh, January, February, and April have, <laughs> have problematic Mondays. So um, I tried to kind of work around that in January and February. You have three evenings of meetings in March, and then uh, because of a holiday and then the beginning of town meeting, I kept the first meeting in April. So you've got some back-to-back -back meetings. So there's, you know, you, you can decide if you want to do something differently, but, um, you know, again, we'll, we're going to enter into town meeting warrant is open now for annual town meeting. We'll talk about this more on Wednesday night, but it means that we're going to head into public hearings again and need, I think it's good to just have the dates on the calendar, especially since some of you have other evening commitments, probably everybody else has other evening commitments. Um, so, um, so this is my proposed uh, slate of meetings. Open to other suggestions, though. 
as long as we're in the remote uh, stage, having the meeting earlier at seven is fine. But once we go back to a work, regular working load, it, it makes it very difficult for me to get out of work and actually get to the meeting at seven. Yeah. I, that means I have to leave early. So um, we can talk about that later. Maybe, you know, revisiting it maybe to 7.30 again once we start meeting in person. I don't know. What does the rest of the board meet, uh, think about that? Um, I, I like the 7 o'clock start time when we're Zooming. It works for yes. me. And all of these dates are fine also. But what are when we meet together? You know, when we do meet together, right. we, we should talk about that. Yep, I agree. Ken, do you think that maybe we should just go through May May then at, at this point? I think, um, or you know, do you want to go through an earlier time with the seven o'clock meeting time set? I think I think it's fine the way Jenny has, has laid out, and okay. if we need to adjust it uh, to in person meeting, then we'll adjust it then. Um, I think you're being too optimistic. I don't think it's going to be that uh, soon. You have to yeah. be. So I know. <laughs> I'm just, uh, <laughs> I am being optimistic, but also um, I wanted to do it through June because in the event that we have a special permit hearing going on and it, it is also town meeting, it's good to have that, those June dates available to continue potentially, right. you know, a hearing. So, yeah. Any, any concerns? So tomorrow at five? Wednesday. 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 Well, we still have public comment. Good night. Don't forget. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Do we, we don't need to vote to adopt those. I. Um, it would be good if you did. Then we oh, then we basically okay. post them on the calendar. Super. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the 2021 proposed uh, meeting dates? So motioned. Do we have a second? second? Thank you, Katie. Uh, we'll run through a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Great, that closes that meeting, that agenda item. Um, so we will now move to open forum. Open my participancy. Any member of the public wishing to speak, uh, please use the raise hand function. In the participant section, I don't think anybody's have... here. By the way, oh, it's just us. It's just us. Okay. Yes. Well, seeing none, I will close <laughs> the open forum for tonight, uh, and we will see everyone at five p.m. on Wednesday. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So motion. Second. Second. <laughs> Roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Katie? Yes. And I'm yes as well. Thanks, everyone. See you Wednesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.